let me ask you another question. I asked you about your favorite map and uh, a couple of you responded. Uh, yes, excellent. Some of you might have a fitness app. Who has a fitness app where you track your bicycle rides, your walks, your runs, whatever you're doing? You can map inside many of those fitness map apps, you get a map. Uh, and part of the reason why is because it's a little bit of an incentive perhaps for you to, oh, if, I, if I go around the block one more time, I'll get, I'll get 2.1 miles today instead of 2.0, right? That's a little bit of an incentive for you to keep moving. And also you can share those walks, runs, bicycle rides, hikes, et cetera, with others. The powerful thing is, you know, you can map that. So I've got my, one of my walks. Um, this is in Southern California. It's up the Crafton Hills. And uh, you can see that uh, not only do I have my, my route on a certain uh, walk, but I also have this elevation profile uh, here where I can see this, this vertical distance is actually in meters here in this case. So I, I, this is the highest point that I actually walked. Actually, not uh, the highest point. Right here is the actual highest point. You can see on the on the three D map on the profile that was the highest elevation on that particular hike. But also, there's another thing that uh, uh, is is going to be important for our mapping discussion, and that is if I zoom in here, and I'm looking at the satellite image, you can see the trail. Okay, all right. Now notice one of the reasons why I wanted to map this particular walk up and down is that I wanted to see the spatial accuracy. Maps are imperfect representations of reality. And this is just one of many examples that I'll share about that. Notice that, first of all, we tend to think of the satellite image as being the truth. Well, uh, without boring you with too much minutia, but I know you're curious about this. The Earth, as you probably know, is an oblate spheroid. Now, scientists for, for centuries were trying to figure out the true shape of the Earth. And uh, one of my favorite stories was the French surveying team that went up to the northern latitudes of their Svalbard, north of Norway. And they sent another team down to Ecuador to try to figure out if the Earth was a egg shape, in other words, longer this way than this way, or a, a, um, a sort of a squashed grapefruit shape. In other words, longer or bit larger circumference around the equator than around the polar uh, uh, circumference. And it turned out to be the latter, right? It is a little bit wider around the equator. You know, look at a planet, a gas giant like Jupiter. It's got a significant equatorial bulge to it, right? It is, it is, it is more oblate than the Earth. But anyway, so starting there, we've got an imperfect shape that we're trying to map on in the first place. So we don't really have a tape measure that we can wrap around the Earth. We have GPS and other related technologies to mapping that we can talk about that get us a little bit closer to the true shape of the Earth. But then the Earth changes. Uh, some of you may recall back in 2011, there were reports after the tsunami and earthquake off of Japan, which was a grim event for sure, but that the Earth actually changed a little bit in its, in its orbital rotation and also a little bit of its shape right there. Yeah, so the Earth is changing. Uh, as well, and it's it's um, it's it's an imperfect sphere, and there are gravity anomalies and other things. But the point is, the satellite images then are that are draped on top of this shape. It all depends on what we collectively agree as the true shape of the Earth. So satellite images should not be viewed as that is the unerrant truth. Okay, satellite images are imperfect as well. All that being said, it does provide us the satellite images does do provide us with a way for me to compare my own fitness walk that day to the image, okay? So in this case, you can see the little yellow and orange, uh, sort of like breadcrumb trails. When you're using a fitness app, it's not recording every single meter. It's dropping certain positions depending on the app, and sometimes you can set it. I wanna drop it every, every second or every 10 meters or every 10 feet or whatever you wanna use. Many of them allow you to do that. In this case, as you can see, uh, I've got uh, uh, a close approximation to the actual trail as depicted on the satellite image, which you realize is not perfect either, but you notice that there are all kinds of differences uh, to my walking versus the satellite image especially right up here. Maybe I was uh, in the lee side of a, of a ridge. I probably was. And so, you know, my, my fitness app, as many of them are, they're based on GPS. So the constellation of GPS satellites 
and Wi-Fi uh, hotspots and cell phone towers. It usually try, try, most of these triangulate on all three of those things. But the point is, more of them were invisible to me at that point. And so the, consequently, the fitness app is trying to figure out, Joseph is, okay, he's in North America. Okay, he's in Southern California. He's in Yucaipa somewhere. I'm gonna, the best guess is gonna be this spot right here. But it was a bit less accurate spatially in this, in this sort of zone Whereas when I went around the corner up to this final point where I turned around, you can see it was actually a bit, a bit better, probably a meter or two off, off depending on the satellite image, which of course is imperfect in the first place. So different levels of accuracy are required for different needs. In my case, hey, this is fine. I just want to record how, how far I hiked that day and I don't care if it was off by a couple of meters or even a couple of tens of meters, no worries. But if I was laying fiber optic cable, or if I was uh, measuring uh, something like a, uh, you know, the earthquake epicenter um, or laying a gas pipeline, I'd want sub-centimeter, sub-inch accuracy. And you've probably seen people, uh, surveyors at the side of the road when you're traveling along in your daily lives with, you know, reflective clothing and they've got a tripod with a high-end survey instrument and they might be sighting a line with another person down the, the, down the way. And they all use GPS as well, but those instruments are are spatially accurate down to the down to a few centimeters because they have different requirements. Say I'm going to lay the cornerstone of this building and I it's got to be spot on. It can't be well, you know, a few meters off because all the architectural drawings are based on okay, I'm going to lay that cornerstone right now and everything is based on that. So uh, anyway, the point is with a fitness app, you can actually map your um, your routes. And so uh, it's another manifestation of this whole mapping platform where you've got a variety of different base maps that you can choose. In my case, I chose the, um, the, the satellite image because I wanted to see that trail and there weren't any streets around. So a satellite image was the perfect choice for me in this case. Okay, so that being said, let's move on to um, the other sort of mapping tools that I want us to get into today. Before I do yeah, that, sir, though. I have a quick question. Are there some apps that can locate you in real time? Sure. So, um, again, what would those be? Yeah. So, thinking about um, your whatever tools you've got. So, for example, for years, and I still have a whole fleet of them actually in the same room I'm in right now, I carried around a GPS receiver. You know, a Garmin GPS receiver, you know, is about this big, sort of an oversized calculator. Um, and that would get me down to about a, a two or three meters off of my true location. And you can still get GPS receivers. Increasingly, though, people are actually using phone apps because they've got a phone and they want to use a phone app. Um, I did some experiments, and I've got many of those online. If you do a search on Joseph Kursky GPS versus phone apps, I've got some spatial experiments where I would actually walk with a phone and a GPS receiver and see what, what the uh, differences it are. But one of them is called Motion X GPS. It's a, it's a GPS emulator that's on a phone. And that is a app. Um, I don't even think I ever paid for that one. Uh, so some of these are free. Some of them uh, you may pay a dollar or two for, but uh, that's one of my favorites. Also, um, if you have a, um, you probably know this, uh, but uh, if you have an iPhone, there is a there is a compass built in app. OK, there's a compass built in app on an iPhone and it gives you your latitude and longitude as well as the compass direction. Now, again, thinking about being critical of the data, this isn't perfect. Right now, I've got a latitude and longitude on here. That's I'm inside a building for one thing and GPS signals cannot travel through solid objects. And so you're compromised. If you're deep in the basement of your house or your workplace right now, um, you might be five meters off. You might be four meters off. If you're outside, it should be a meter or two, depending on you know, whether you're in a canyon or in a heavy tree cover. But if you're out in the wide open spaces, you should be, you should be able to get to within about two meters of your actual location, even with just the built-in um, iPhone compass app. 
so yeah, we could talk about more, but that's, uh, those are some of my favorites. And um, again, realizing that, you know, if you're laying a fiber optic cable or a gas pipeline or a cornerstone of, you know, Mile High Stadium, you're not going to use uh, Motion X GPS and you're not going to use your phone app. You're going to actually use a higher end uh, Frontier Precision makes these. Uh, most of them are um, uh, Trimble units. There's also Topcon, and these are, you know, units that are $10,000-ish that they're using. So, you know, more money, but totally worth it for those applications because, again, they've got to get, they got to get as spot on as possible. And even these uh, t tools nowadays, there's just a huge advance over the old days. And when you think about how all those topographic maps were made uh, in the not-too-distant past, and I started at the USGS right when the sort of the transformation to digital was happening. And we actually had to go as part of our, you know, routes of mapping out in the field with an old-style theodolite, which measured angles and distances. And you had someone 100 meters away, you know, with a, with a leveling rod, and you'd have to figure out what the angle and that was hugely labor intensive. That's why those topographic maps, even for just the US at the one to 24,000 scale that many of you love using for hiking, uh, that program was started in the 1930s and it wasn't finished until 1995. I was in the office when that uh, last map was made and it was, it was a big celebration because that was a 60 year program at that scale to map because it was so time consuming, right? You had to have those field crews to go out and survey and you've probably seen benchmarks right, that were used to spatially enable these maps. I'm getting into a little bit of mapping history now, but it's fun stuff. Um, in the, a lot of times they're on the tops of 14ers, right, so you've seen Long's Peak, you know, elevation, USGS benchmark, and sometimes the benchmarks are from the Colorado Geo, uh, Geological Survey. Sometimes they're from NOAA or the National Geodetic Survey. But anyway, these benchmarks were physically placed there because they were surveyed with again, the best accuracy they had at the time, and then they could triangulate a bunch of these survey markers. Uh, survey markers are not so much needed anymore. They're still they're still relied on in certain cases, but uh, you've seen those. You've even seen them probably if you've been to the state capitol. There's a benchmark on one of the steps that says this is a mile high above sea level, and this is the benchmark, and it was surveyed on X date and so on. I believe that's a USGS benchmark, so I'm I'm rather proud of that one. Anyway, but uh, the point is, uh, yes, there are. It's it's amazing how things have advanced. But again, it's because people actually are demanding uh, these kinds of, of tools. So let's, speaking of tools, I'm going to show you one more in this sort of zone number one. We've looked at health, wildfires, my walkability map. But I want to show you another one that uh, uh, is, is just an example of real-time data feeds, but yet a powerful teaching and learning tool. And this, was, this one's called the Water Balance App. And it uses these live interactive web maps with, in this case, not real time, but near real time. So in the upper left, I've got about six variables, and it's all about water, soil moisture, snowpack, evapotranspiration, et cetera. Let's take a look at precipitation. Okay, you and I know that it's been dry out here in the West, but not so much. If you've talked to people out in the Midwest and East, they're, they're getting lots of rain. Okay, so let's take a look at Let's look at the Amazon. Okay, if I click in the Amazon here, I'm gonna get a graph that's really fascinating because if I hover over the graph, as you folks know, it's not summer or winter, it's the wet season and the dry season, right? So if I hover over these graphs, I can say, oh, the wet season is about May, June. The dry season is right about now, September, October. So that's the that's the seasonal cycle. And you can see on the left side here, it's in a bit tiny of a font, but you can see it's in millimeters per year. So this is a significant amount, right, of, uh, of rain, of precipitation. So just this one, I mean, 452 millimeters, right? That's 45 centimeters. That's more rain than we get in Colorado in, in years, <laughs> especially this year. Anyway, the point is um, you've, got, uh, you've got quite a bit of power at your fingertips to teach, to learn um, about different precipitation and how it's changing. So I mentioned it's not quite real time. The latest uh, month in this particular web mapping application is in June. Now let's contrast that with, let's look at Southern Libya. As you probably would hypothesize, there are entire months where there's absolutely no precipitation at all. And then there are other months where, okay, 10 millimeters, that's one centimeter, right? That's like this. Okay, so uh, you've got a vastly different 
pattern. And again, it's all because of geography, right? The, the, uh, the convergence zone, we've got the high pressure uh, in the uh, you know, 20 to 30 degrees north latitude, and that results in that huge swath of dry land all the way from, from uh, really uh, southern Iran all the way over to uh, Mauritania and West Africa. So uh, it's fascinating to be able to, uh, I think, go and drill down into various places around the country and say, hey, I want to look at Denver. And uh, okay, well, what's it like here? Well, if I pan back here, I can see, oh, wow, 2002. Yeah, I remember that drought year. We had some significant fires, uh, almost as bad as what we had this summer, right? And um, sadly, we've had even worse fires this summer. But some of you might remember that 2002. And, uh, you know, we've had some, a couple of decent months recently, precipitation wise. Um, but we've also had some, you know, like looking here, December and January, you probably remember this last winter. It was like, hey, you can go out with a light jacket on in Denver. Um, there's no snow on the ground. And it was, what, mid-February before we had any decent snow from be between like no uh, Thanksgiving, we had that big one. And then it was like mid-February before we had, we had anything decent again. So anyway, the point is, you've got this incredible tool at your fingertips. Let's take a look at snowpack. Since we're in Colorado, we like looking at snow, right? It's pretty, pretty important to us. Uh, here. So we can look at uh, snowpack. Oh my gosh, this is, this is just great. To have this at your fingertips, interactive, on the web, I'm not signed into anything. I haven't had to log into anything we've done today. So this is just all on the web with these web mapping services that are produced by my organization and then government agencies, uh, academia, and others uh, on a hourly basis, really.